Well, hello. Our uh, class in Illuminist history this month is on the subject of Christian esotericism. Jesus said, I shall give you what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no hand has touched and what has never occurred to the human mind. Jesus said to them, when you make the two one and when you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside and the above like the below and when you make the male and the female one and the same so that the male not be male nor the female be female and when you fashion eyes in the place of an eye and a hand in place of a hand and a foot in place of a foot and a likeness in place of a likeness then you will enter the kingdom. Jesus said, when you disrobe without being ashamed and take up your garments and place them under your feet like little children and tread on them, then you will see the sons of the living one and you will not be afraid. Some scholars believe that the text from which these quotes are taken, the Gospel of Thomas, was written prior to the Gospels of the Bible and more nearly represent the teachings of the original Christianity. It is a more radical and startling message than the Christianity with which we are familiar, confronting not only the limits of human law, but of human reason, of the humanly possible. Where did such a teaching come from? And why did it soften into the more reassuring and familiar Christianity that we've come to know? Last time, we looked at the development of the Jewish sect known as the Essenes, a tradition originally centered on the prophet Enoch that existed alongside and in competition with the Zadokite tradition centered on Moses that eventually became the mainstream. We saw how the Essenes then positioned themselves as the minority party uh, who felt that they had the more accurate understanding of the authentic Jewish law, which they would then enact, even as most everyone else got it wrong. In its most extreme form, this led to a separatist group that split off to form the community at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. This subsect, guided by the one they referred to as the teacher of righteousness, led lives of great asceticism and purity, confident that they were upholding the spirit of the restored temple of God, while the temple in Jerusalem persisted in error and uncleanliness. One of the clues for a seen influence on Christianity is the prevalence of the phrase son of man in the gospels and in Paul. As a title, this has its origins in the first book of Enoch, which is part of the Essene tradition, not of the mainstream Zedekite tradition. The son of man has a human form, but exists in heaven, yet will descend and put an end to the reign of the evil spirits, inaugurating an age of righteousness. There's an implication that the transfigured Enoch becomes the son of man, but it's phrased in such a manner that there's room for interpretation either way. But the very idea of the Messiah as a figure who descends from heaven, as opposed to being merely a righteous king, may very well have its source in the first book of Enoch. Another current of Jewish thought in that time involved the Pharisees. One gets the impression from the New Testament that the Pharisees were legalistic button sorters who were more caught up in the letter of the law than matters of the spirit. But in fact, they were the progressives of the time, especially those who were partial to the house of Hillel. Hillel is credited with formulating the original golden rule. A prospective convert asked that the Torah be explained to him while Hillel stood on one foot. Hillel accepted the question, converted him on the spot, saying, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. And in other ways, Hillel emphasized the importance of love and of the wisdom of the heart. For a long time, I wonder if what we might have had in Jesus was a teacher who combined Hillel's doctrine of the wisdom of the heart with the Essene conviction that everyone took God, uh, to be that what everyone took to be God's will was completely mistaken. What the world thinks is right, what the world thinks is lawful, 
decent, sane, possible, is entirely a lie. The real truth had to be sought within. A teaching like that might at first be handed down in mind-blowing aphorisms like those of the Gospel of Thomas. But over time, a teaching like that might be too confrontational, too much work to be continued to, to continue to be transmitted in its purity. As for the story of early Christianity, we might look to accounts of a group known as the Ebionites for clues. Every detail of the Ebionites is disputed, so no one can say for sure. But the story is that the Ebionites were the descendants of the original followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, and they maintained a narrative of what had happened quite different from the account that became more widely known. To those followers, the Ebionites, Jesus was the Messiah, but was not the Son of God. There was no virgin birth, and they thought of themselves as Jews who followed the law of Moses, just like other Jews. After the death of Jesus, an usurper named Paul, who had never known Jesus, started teaching doctrines quite alien to what Jesus had taught, and those false teachings became what the world knew as Christianity, while the Ebionites quietly practiced the original teachings in small communities north of Jerusalem. Perhaps the existence of the Ebionites is just legend. We only have accounts of their existence from early mainstream Christians. But it wouldn't seem to have been in their interest to make up the existence of a rival faction, which leads me to believe that they were a real group. And if they were a real group, that seems to be evidence for the real existence of Jesus, because why would a sect of people fabricate a story about how they were the losers of a historical struggle? So on one hand, we have the hidden original teachings of Jesus, about which perhaps the Gospel of Thomas provides a glimpse. And on the other, we have the movement popularized by Paul that became known as Christianity. So we have to take a look at the Christianity of Paul in order to understand what came after. Paul was a Romanized Jew who came from the city of Tarsus in Asia Minor. One point of interest about Tarsus is that it was the center for the worship of a form of Dionysus known as Sebasius, and that his worship there, Sebasius's worship there, took the form of the consumption of sacramental bread and wine among the devotees, representing the body and blood of Sebasius. Talmudic scholar Hayam Maccabee provides an in-depth analysis of Paul's career from the standpoint of historical Jewish studies in his book, The Mythmaker, Paul and the Invention of Christianity. In his view, Paul, although born of a Jewish family, was raised as a Roman and culturally was Roman. He seems to have had a conversion experience at some point, which led him to seek the affirmation of his Jewish identity. And perhaps this corresponds to his accounts of coming to see uh, the Jesus movement whose members he had persecuted as the divinely appointed teachings to which he was called to evangelize. From an analysis of his writings, Maccabee sees Paul not as the Pharisee he claims to be, but as a superficial imitator of Pharisaic discourse. Paul wishes to cloak himself in Pharisaic authority, but on close inspection, his arguments have some of the style of Pharisaic logic while being full of the sort of fallacies that genuinely trained Pharisees would never have accepted. So Paul is a poser. He has something to prove and an impression he wishes to project. We can thus see in him much of the personality we've come to know from later founders of new religious movements, such as Joseph Smith or L. Ron Hubbard. He weaves his product from stories of the life of Jesus and his early followers. In this view, there's every reason to suppose that he invents the story of the Last Supper and Jesus' command to commemorate it out of whole cloth as a way of introducing the sacraments of the Sabasius cult of his hometown into Judaism, a notion that would have been abhorrent to the traditional Jews of his time. But notice how the Gospel of Thomas was not concerned with the stories about the life and death of Jesus, how in all probability Jesus' teaching was not concerned with the story of his own life. The religion concerned with the life and death of Jesus was the invention of Paul. That is not to say that Paul's invention was without its own kind of Jesus or, in, or with, uh, Jesus, his own kind of genius or inspiration. At this point, we might want to take a look at what we might call 
core Christianity or the faces, uh, facets of the Christian religion that form the baseline out of which grew the manifold expressions of Christian esotericism. Since most of us here come from a Christian culture, we each have a large storehouse of experience with Christianity and access to the oceans of inspiration that the followers of the Christian path have expressed over the centuries. But we only have time to reflect on a small sampling of its aspects of particular interest to an illuminist perspective. Let's begin with the heart, the emphasis of which we recall came from the Pharisaic house of Hillel. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. This could be taken as simply another religious stricture. If your sentiments aren't this way, they should be. But giving it such a primary importance makes it a method of revolutionizing the relationship of self and other. Opening the heart to the love between oneself and the divine, or one might say between oneself and being as such, is a transformative event. And in light of that, opening the heart to love between one person and another is even more so. When we look at how much of religion, all religion, is caught up in expressions of law, obedience, fidelity, sacrifice, and discipline, it becomes apparent how radical and personal this approach to spirituality is. To the extent that we recognize our innate love of the divine, we begin to feel the enormity of divine love for us. In beginning to feel the divine love for all of us, we find ourselves in a transfigured world. This doctrine is no less profound for being utterly familiar. There is also the paradoxical yet significant doctrine of the Trinity, not held by every expression of Christianity, but shared in a variety of forms across many streams of mystical religion. We might recall from our previous classes that Plotinus, interpreting the works of Plato, considered the most fundamental structure of reality to be the three hypostases, the one, then the intellect emanating from the one, and lastly, the soul emanating from the intellect. But at times, he referred to intellect as being, eventually explaining that what emanated from the one is at the same time what understands and what is understood. The aspect of this emanation that understands is intellect, while the aspect that is understood is being, also called the intelligible. Later Neoplatonists spoke of three facets, being, intellect, and the movement between being and intellect called life. Being, life, intellect. This is what is known as the intelligible triad. Around 357 AD, the theologian Marius Victorinus attributed the biblical trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to the intelligible triad. From being, or the Father, comes life, or the Son, and intellect, or the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that totally works for me. On the other hand, we have, on one hand, we have the ineffable immensity of being the Father. On the other, the infinite discernment of intellect, the Holy Spirit. And in the midst, vibrant life itself, the Son. Sign me up. Unfortunately, matters couldn't stay that clear. For one thing, uh, Augustine later declared the triad of being, knowledge, and will that came to be a focus of much Christian theology. And then later theologians, such as Cassiodorus and Maximus the Confessor, attributed the Holy Trinity to the intelligible triad as being the Father, intellect the Son, and life the Holy Spirit, which for me, at least, makes no sense whatsoever. And we see this through much of Christianity. It inspires good works sometimes, but the philosophy gets garbled up all too frequently. Another facet of Christianity consider, to consider is the guru principle. Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism, for example, recognize the way in which rarefied spiritual understanding can be transmitted through physical proximity to accomplished adepts of certain kinds. This was not found in Judaism or Greco-Roman culture, but we see it in the accounts of Jesus. 
more than simply a prophet or lawgiver, his bodily presence was said to be transformative. Perhaps this is just a coincidence, but perhaps Jesus was the sort of adept who could communicate a radical state of being through personal contact in the manner of Eastern gurus. Perhaps this radical state of being was indeed transmitted across a body of practitioners who maintained a level of visionary accomplishment and a corresponding radical counterculture for a while. Christianity has sometimes been called the child of a marriage between the Jewish and Hellenistic cultures. One aspect of that is that the Jewish concept of Messiah gets grafted onto the Greek notion of cosmopolitanism. In other words, of each individual being a citizen of the entire world. So for Christianity, there is a ruler guiding the entire world to liberation. The human race has a shared guidance. For the West, at least, this is something new. We are all too familiar with the downside of this, that those who don't adhere to what is considered the proper doctrine are disciplined at best or annihilated at worst. But the idea needn't be pursued through violence or even sanctimoniousness. On a practical level, it can be an invitation for people of different views to inquire ever more deeply into themselves and one another to seek the guidance accept accessible to all of us without prejudice. But on a deeper level, the notion is conducive to an understanding sometimes referred to as trust in being or basic trust. If we are all being guided, then there is something about reality that cares about us all. If we see ourselves and others as being divinely guided, then all unfolding becomes infused with a sense of meaning and belonging. And this can be healing in a profound way. To move on, it wouldn't be Christianity as we know it without the crucifixion. And it should go without saying that whatever Jesus taught when he was alive, it had nothing to do with the crucifixion. But the Christian religion we wound up with is centered on his death upon the cross. On one level, this has to do with the discipline of remembering one's own death. In a fundamental way, our bodies and souls strive above all to survive to persist, and along with that comes a tendency to block out any thought or awareness of our deaths. The crucifixion as we know it seems to be an invention of Paul's, and by that I don't mean that he fabricated the historical event of Jesus's execution, although who can say, but that he created the conceptual framework around it and made it central to the religion he promoted. This involves focusing attention on the biggest death that could be imagined the death of God's own son, the death of God's spirit descended into the world of matter, suffering a torturous and humiliating end. So God, in his infinite sensitivity, shares with each one of us the feeling of undergoing death. Not only, not only are we told that this is so, we are asked to constantly remember it. This is a way of overcoming our resistance to remembering our own death, of realizing the preciousness of life, our life, everyone's life. And this ties into the theme of love and compassion we referred to earlier. And it can be, if held with intention, a method of heightening awareness. This too may be a method that Paul imported into a Judaic movement from the Dionysian cult of Sabazius. Sabazius was particularly worshiped as a psychopomp or guide of the soul after death. And we see that role subsequently taken over by Jesus. Dying and resurrected gods, and or gods who abide in the realm of the dead, have in common the message that physical death is, in a mysterious way, not as final as we tend to take it to be. The linear mind, the mind of the separate self, always rushes in at this point and projects some specific narrative. Our separate selves live on after death on Big Rock Canty Mountain, or else our separate selves appear again in a new body. There tends to be this leap from, I'm going to be gone, nothing left of me but dust, to, oh, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to persist in a way that conforms to my conceptual structures. In Christianity, there are various familiar narratives that are laid down about the afterlife. But the core teaching on the subject is the book of Revelation, 
and the associated practice of the mass. And while there's enormous effort put into translating this into an understandable doctrine, I would propose that the story of Revelation is intended to break the rational mind and leave our conceptual apparatus in tatters so that we may open ourselves to the transcendent mystery of death with fresh eyes, and that the sacred drama at the heart of the Mass is intended to keep that openness vibrant and ineffable throughout our religious lives. Too often that's not what happens, but I posit that that's what it's for. Now let's begin to branch out from core Christianity. Marcion of Sinope, Sinope shown here, expounded his form of Christianity to become known as Marcionism after the Bar Kokhba revolt of the Jews in Judea against the Romans from 132 to 136 Common Era. This revolt pretty much devastated the Jewish presence there, so that Judaism from that point forward existed primarily in other Roman provinces outside of Judea. This also greatly diminished the social standing and tolerance of Jews throughout the empire. Against this backdrop, Marcion proclaimed that Jesus was the son of the true God who was not the God of the Jews. The Jews worshiped the malevolent Demiurge, which is why there is so much contrast between the fierce and vengeful God of the Hebrew Bible and the loving, all-embracing God spoken of by Jesus. Marcion claimed that this was the understanding perpetuated by Paul, the only apostle with the true interpretation of Jesus' teachings. We see here that we've come 180 degrees from the views of the Ebionites. Marcion assembled scriptures into one organized canon to make his point, consisting of a version of the Gospel of Luke and 10 of Paul's epistles, which he distinguished from what he coined as the Old Testament. It is thought that the mainstream church only then organized their own New Testament as a counter to Marcionite doctrine. Although his teachings weren't entirely what we call Gnostic, his doctrine distinguishing between the Demiurge and the true God becomes the distinguishing mark of all the Gnosticism that came afterwards. It's possible, though, that the trend of distancing from the traditional God of the Jews in favor of a more transcendent God may have had its origins within Judaism itself outside of Christian influence. Coming back to the Essenes, and the Judaism centered around the books of Enoch from which the Essene movement emerged, we can see how the alienation from mainstream Jewish law, belief in malevolent spirits arising from the interbreeding of angels and women, and condemnation of the temple in Jerusalem could have led to a view that the object of Jewish worship was a fabrication of fallen spirits. At this point, it's worth noting that our understanding of Gnosticism comes in two distinct phases. For most of history following Gnosticism's heyday, there were only, uh, they were only known through the accounts of their enemies, the authorities of the mainline Christian church who were concerned with documenting heresies. But then, in 1945, an astounding collection of Coptic texts were discovered near the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi thought to have been buried in the fourth century common era to preserve them against those persecuting heresies, these documents are widely varied, but the vast majority of them are from one or another form of Gnosticism. The discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library revolutionized our view of the Gnostic tradition uh, and of religious history in general. It's from the Nag Hammadi Library that we came to learn that some of the earliest Gnostic texts had no Christian content while others, such as the Apocryphon of John, seem to have had Christianity inserted into them by later editors. The Apocryphon of John is the central scripture of Sethian Gnosticism, found especially in Egypt. The oldest layer of the text begins with the depiction of an utterly unknowable supreme god, the invisible virginal spirit. He emits his feminine aspect as his first thought, named Barbalo. She requests the invisible spirit to realize four of her attributes as separate hypostases, foreknowledge, incorruptibility, eternal life, and truth. 
Barbalo then conceived and gave birth to a spark of light who the invisible spirit anointed, in other words, made Christ. Around Christ manifested the four lights, Harmozel, Oriel, Davith, and Elaleth. Each light came with three eons, of whom the last is Sophia. Through the invisible spirit, Barbalo and Christ emerged, actually, let me say that again. Through the invisible spirit, Barbalo and Christ emerged the perfect human, Adamas. Adamas was placed over the first realm with the first light, Harmozel. Over the second realm was placed the son of Adamas, Seth, with the second light, Oriel. In the third realm were placed the children of Seth with the third light, David. In the fourth realm were placed those who did not repent at first, but did eventually with the fourth light, Elaleth. It was at this point that the twelfth eon, Sophia, decided to create without the consent of the invisible father. The result was a misshapen being that transformed into a thing with the head of a lion and the body of a serpent. Sophia cast it out from the realm of immortal beings, surrounded him with a brilliant cloud, and placed him on a throne in the middle of the cloud so that no one would see him, and named him Ialdabaoth. Ialdabaoth assumed command and created realms for himself. The remainder of the story goes through Sophia's repentance, Ialdabaoth's creation of the visible cosmos, and a material humanity to worship him a plan to rescue humanity through the creation of Eve, secretly infused with the wisdom of the immortal realms, and the subsequent struggle of Yaldabaoth versus the immortals for the salvation of humanity. Interpreting this could take a whole series of classes just by itself, the, but the main thing I want to bring out here is that this seems to be a depiction of the Messiah, the Christ, as a metaphysical entity or part of the composition of reality from outside the Jesus movement. This is a divine Christ from a Jewish movement competing with the followers of Jesus. As a second point, the feminine plays a complex role in the story. Barbalo is the first emanation of the divine and is depicted as utterly sublime, while Sophia is the fallen eon who is to blame for all the imperfection in a kind of reflection of the traditional story of the temptation of Eve. But Eve herself in this story is the saviorist of humanity, sent from the transcendent realms beyond the cosmos. Valentinian Gnosticism comes from Valentinus, who almost became Bishop of Rome. So his teachings are probably the closest that Gnosticism ever came to the mainstream. His central tenet was that knowledge or Gnosis is the salvation of the inner being and that the Christian scriptures have to be decoded in order to understand them as the struggle between those of psychic disposition, meaning completely caught up in the world of appearances, represented by Jews and Gentiles, and the pneumatics, or those who live by the spirit, represented in the scriptures as Christians. But the care should be taken to understand that calling oneself a Christian doesn't necessarily make you pneumatic while not all Jews or Gentiles necessarily mean psychic in his sense. In this system, there are two forms of Sophia. There's a higher Sophia who remains in the upper world after her error and repentance of it, but there's also her offspring, Sophia Akamoth, that is removed from, from the Pleroma and becomes the heroine of the rest of the drama. Sophia Akamoth, or lower wisdom, the daughter of higher wisdom, is the mother of the Demiurge, who was identified with the God of the Old Testament. The Christ is the perfected creation of the 30 eons, and in the later Ptolemaean system of Valentinianism, the Christ and the fallen Sophia become the bride and bridegroom and produce 70 celestial angels. Christ descends into Jesus at his baptism, thereby becoming the savior of humanity. The principle of limit, which we might recall from Plato, appears in Valentinianism as Horos. I tried to tell myself that despite the similarity in sound, it didn't have anything to do with the Egyptian god Horus, but apparently some scholars believe that it does. Horos, as limit, separates the fallen eons from the upper eons, and so helps to create an ordered world. Horos is also called Staros, or the cross, perhaps recalling the Chai 
or X shape associated with the world soul in Plato's Timaeus. An important feature of Valentinian Gnosticism is its rejection of dualism. As Irenaeus writes, this collection of passions was the substance of the matter from which the world was formed. From her desire of returning to him who gave her life, every soul belonging to this world and that of the demiurge himself derived its origin. So our world of matter is made up of the longing to be reunited with the divine. Feel into that for a while. The world of matter is made up of the longing to be reunited with the divine. And the demiurge, rather than being malevolent, as in the Sethian Gnosticism, is merely uninformed. The highest sacrament for Valentinians was apparently that of the bridal chamber. The Valentinian Gospel of Philip says, there were three buildings specifically for sacrifice in Jerusalem. The one facing the west was called the Holy, another facing south was called the Holy of the Holy, the third facing east was called the Holy of the Holies, the place where only the high priest enters. Baptism is the Holy building. Redemption is the Holy of the Holy. The Holy of the Holies is the bridal chamber. Another point of interest about the Valentinians was their gender equality. Women could be prophets, healers, teachers, or priests. On the subject of the feminine, the Nag Hammadi Library contains one text that cannot be missed, the Thunder Perfect Mind. It is a discourse from God delivered in the first person female. For I am the first and the last, I am the honored one and the scorned one, I am the whore and the holy one, I am the wife and the virgin, I am the mother and the daughter, I am the members of my mother, I am the barren ones, and many are her sons. I am she whose wedding is great, and I have not taken a husband. I am the midwife, and she who does not bear. I am the solace of my labor pains. I am the bride and the bridegroom, and it is my husband who begot me. I am the mother of my father, and the sister of my husband, and he is my offspring. For many are the pleasant forms which exist in numerous sins and incontinencies and disgraceful passions and fleeting pleasures which men embrace until they become sober and go up to their resting place. And they will find me there and they will live and they will not die again. No one knows what this is. If it's Gnostic, it's unlike any other Gnostic text. Similarly, for Hermeticism, Judaism, Platonism, Stoicism, it's not like any of them, and yet it cannot be ignored. Syria was the home of Thomasine Christianity, including the Th Gospel of Thomas we discussed earlier. Another of their texts is the Acts of Thomas, which includes the brief but powerful Hymn of the Pearl. Here's an abridged version. Then from our house in the east, after they had made preparations, my parents set me forth. Then they made with me an agreement and they inscribed it in my heart so that it would not be forgotten. If you would go down into Egypt and bring back the one pearl which is in the middle of the sea, surrounded by the hissing serpent, then you will put on your glorious garment and your toga which rests is laid over it. And with your brother, our second in command, you will be heir in our kingdom. I went straight to the serpent, around its lodging I settled, until it was going to slumber and sleep, that I might snatch my pearl from it. But in some way or another, they perceived that I was not of their country, so they mingled their deceit with me, and they made me eat their food. I forgot that I was a son of kings, and I served their king, and I forgot the pearl, on account of which my parents had sent me. My parents perceived my oppression and were grieved for me, and they wrote a letter to me. Awake and arise from your sleep and hear the words of our letter. Remember that you are a son of kings, considering the slavery you are serving. Remember the pearl on account of which you were sent to Egypt. 
I remembered that I was a son of kings, and my free soul longed for its natural state. I remembered the pearl on account of which I was sent to Egypt. Then I began charming it, the formidable and hissing serpent. Then I snatched away the pearl, and I turned to go back to my father's house. He rejoiced in me and received me, and I was with him and in his kingdom. And he also promised that to the place, the, to the palace of the king of kings, I will hasten with him. And with my offering and with my pearl, I should appear with him before our king. Variations of this story can be found in Manichaeism, Islam, and most of the storytelling traditions of the world. One can see it in The Matrix, in Dune, even Harry Potter. And it reframes the Jesus story as the quest to recognize one's divine destiny, a story that applies to each one of us, not only the savior of the world. Believing that the world is a production of a false god led many Gnostics to ascetic practices, not unlike those of the Essenes. But other Gnostic sects went in the other direction. If religious law came from a false source, the duty of the Gnostic was to fly in the face of it. These were the libertine Gnostics. Clement of Alexandria provides an excerpt from the scripture of the Carpocratian Gnostics called On Righteousness. The righteousness of God is a kind of universal fairness and equality. There is equality in the heaven which is stretched out in all directions and contains the entire earth in its circle. The night reveals equally all the stars. The light of the sun, which is the cause of the daytime and the father of light, God pours out from above the earth in equal measure on all those who have power to see, for all see alike. There is no distinction between rich and poor, people and governor, stupid and clever, female and male, free men and slaves. Even the irrational animals are not accorded any different treatment, but in just the same way, God pours out from above sunlight equally upon all the animals. In them, the universality of God's fairness is manifest. Furthermore, all plants of whatever sort are sown equally in the earth. He brought female to be with male and in the same way united all animals. He thus showed righteousness to be a universal fairness and equality. But those who have been born in this way have denied the universality, which is the corollary of their birth and say, let him who has taken one woman keep her whereas all alike can have her just as all other animals do. Clement goes on to describe their erotic agape feasts, but a more detailed account of a similar rite is provided by Epiphanius in his account of the Borborites. And those who are easily shocked might want to brace themselves. But I shall get right down to the worst part of the deadly description of them, for they vary in their wicked teaching of what they please, which is, first of all, that they hold their wives in common. And if a guest who is of their persuasion arrives, they have a sign that men give women and women give men, a tickling of the palm as they clasp hands in supposed greeting to show that the visitor is of their religion. And once they recognize each other from this, they start feasting right away, and they set the table with lavish provisions for eating meat and drinking wine, even if they are poor. But then, after a drinking bout and, let us say, stuffing their overstuffed veins, they get hot for each other next, and the husband will move away from his wife and tell her, speaking to his own wife, get up, perform the agape with the brother. And when the wretched couple has made love, and I am truly ashamed to mention the vile things they do, for as the holy apostle says, it is a shame even to speak of what goes on among them. Still, I should not be ashamed to say what they are not ashamed to do, to arouse horror by every means in those who hear what obscenities they are prepared to perform. For after having made love with the passion of fornication, in addition to lift their blasphemy up to heaven, the woman and the man receive the man's emission in their own hands, and they stand with their eyes raised heavenward, but the filth on their hands, and pray, if you please, the ones they call the Stratiotics and Gnostics, and offer that stuff on their hands to the true Father of all, and say, We offer thee this gift, the body of Christ. And they eat it, partaking of their own dirt, and they say, This is the body of Christ, and this is the Pascha, because of which our bodies suffer and are compelled to acknowledge the passion of Christ. It goes on from there and gets more intense. Scholars think that some amount of this might be exaggeration, 
but that much of it has the ring of truth to me. If there's a growing sentiment that the constraints of religious law have been lifted, some people will go there because they can. There's one sect of Gnostics that survives to this day, the Mandaeans, who live mostly in Iraq before, uh, 2000, the, before the 2003 US invasion. They are not Christian, but rather maintain that they are descended from the followers of John the Baptist. Some of their doctrines are known only to initiates, but they do believe in an ineffable God who delegated the creation of the world to a secondary deity, and that the soul is in exile in this world, longing to be reunited with the Supreme Being. Besides John the Baptist, they revere Adam, Seth, Enos, and Noah, among others. A movement partly derived from Gnosticism, but clearly in a class of its own, was Manichaeanism, founded by the Persian prophet Mani in the third century. Mani modestly declared himself to be the successor and possibly the reincarnation of Zoroaster, the Buddha, and Jesus. While their revelations were incomplete, while their revelations were incomplete, his teachings, Mani's teachings, were for the entire world. Now, if you find that the cosmology and pantheons of Gnosticism are too plain and simple for your taste, Manichaeism is the religion for you. In it, you can find teachings from the Gnostics, from the books of Enoch, from the Gospel of Thomas, from Buddhism, from Zoroastrianism, all ripped, uh, whipped up into a Rococo formation of mind-boggling elaborateness. And it's sold. It spread across the Roman Empire, throughout the Persian Sassanid Empire, into China, into Tibet. Uh, Augustine was himself a Manichaean before he converted to Christianity. The Catholic Church eventually banned it and fiercely persecuted its followers, extinguishing it in the Western Empire in the 5th century and in the Eastern Empire in the 6th. It continued in China until the 14th century. Now, these days, Manichaean is used to mean starkly dualistic, as in the Manichaean thread of contemporary American politics, but Manichaeanism is involved with so much more than that. The Manichaeans placed particular importance on the Hymn of the Pearl, so they must have been doing something right. We next consider a thread of semi-Gnostic sects persecuted for heresy. The Polycans, from the 7th to the 9th centuries, were an Armenian group possibly descended from the Marcionites, who believed that Jesus, rather than being born the Son of God, was made Christ at the time of his baptism. They also apparently didn't believe a trinity. For this, of course, they had to be scattered into Bulgaria and the Byzantine Empire, alternatively persecuted and tolerated. Their influence seems to have been instrumental in the rise of the Bogomils in the Balkans from the 10th to 14th centuries, who were heavily dualistic and possibly influenced by the Manichaeans. They believed that God had two sons, Satanael and Mikael. Satanael created the material world, but couldn't create Adam without God's assistance. Then Adam sold himself and his descendants to Satanael for the right to till the ground. Then Mikael incarnated as Jesus Christ to rescue humanity, knocking the ill right off of Satanael, at which point he became Satan. But then Satan came back with the crucifixion and the creation of the Orthodox Church. Fun fact, the English term buggery is originally due to the Bogomils. Bugger meant Bulgarian, and the Bulgarians were all thought to be abominable heretics, in essence, bogomils, so buggery equaled heresy, and only later did it come to mean something more specific. The Cathars, also called Albigensians between the 12th and 14th centuries, were possibly influenced by the Policians and definitely by the bogomils. They believed in two deities, the good God of the New Testament and the evil God of the Old Testament. They believed that human spirits were angels trapped in the material realm of the evil god, doomed to reincarnate until they underwent the Cathar consolamentum ritual, at which point they became vegetarian and celibate. Pope Innocent III waged the Albigensian crusade against them from 2009 to 2029, and they were then persecuted by the medieval inquisition until they were eradicated in 1350. The Cathars, opposed the authority of the clergy and the Catholic Church, and had no sacraments other than the consolamentum. They rejected war and capital punishment. 
They believed in the equality of women and assigned particular importance to Mary Magdalene. Dominic, later Saint Dominic, was assigned among others by the Pope to convert Cathars. He determined that since the representatives of the Catholic Church acted with much pomp and ceremony, while the Cathars tended to be ascetic and upstanding, papal legates needed to, be, uh, needed to lead a reformed apostolic life if they were to be effective at conversion, and this led to the founding of the Dominican Order. The legends and rumors around the Bogomils and Cathars have echoed from their time to ours. Occult groups in Slavic countries frequently claim descent from the Bogomils, and Gnostic, Rosicrucian, and Freemasonic lines in France are rife with claimants to the heritage of the Cathars. Apart from Gnosticism, to move back in time a bit, in the fifth to sixth centuries, a body of work appeared attributed to Dionysius the Areopagite. This is a pseudonym. The real Dionysius the Areopagite was an Athenian judge supposedly converted by Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. But the subterfuge was widely believed, and the writings profoundly influenced the course of both the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Three classes ago, we covered the works of the last great Hellenic pagan philosopher Proclus. The writings of Pseudo-Dionysius are pretty much cut whole cloth from those of Proclus, adapted for a Christian audience. These introduce the notion of negative theology into Christianity. The idea that since God is utterly beyond comprehension, we draw nearer to him by remembering what he is not. That he who is the preeminent cause of everything intelligibly perceived is not himself any one of the things intelligibly perceived. The reasoning behind all this is fully laid out by Proclus and mostly by Plotinus before him, but it became and remains a cornerstone of Christian theology. Dionysius' work on the divine names restates much of what Proclus wrote about the Hainads, applied to the Christian God rather than to the Neoplatonic one. And the taxonomy of the choirs of angels, less common today but influential for centuries within the church of uh, cherubim, seraphim, thrones, dominations, virtues, powers, principalities, archangels, and angels, is a Christian appropriation of the metaphysical triads worked out rationally, or fairly so, by Proclus. Other important Christian Neoplatonists worth investigating include Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, John Scotus Ariagena, Bonaventure, Meister Eckhart, and to a degree, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. I couldn't ignore this opportunity to dwell on a personal favorite of mine, the Mallorcan visionary Ramon Lull, dubbed Dr. Illuminatus, who lived from 1232 to 1315. As a young man, he was an idle courtier to the King of Mallorca until he had a series of religious visions that left him transformed. He was convinced that he was destined to die converting Muslims to Christianity, to establish schools for the teachings of foreign languages to missionaries, and to write on how to overcome objections to being converted, all of which he proceeded to do. In addition, he wrote the first novel in the Catalan language, and so is considered the founder of literary Catalan, similarly to the way that Dante is the founder of literary Italian. Having learned Arabic, an extremely rare skill for a European of his day, he studied Islamic mystical literature, and his book of the lover and the beloved introduced the idea of the lover and beloved into European mystical discourse. He did indeed campaign for schools of Arabic and other languages spoken by non-Christians, which were eventually founded for the first time. He is the inventor and coiner of the term immaculate conception. And this turns out to be quite different from what I thought it was. It doesn't refer to the conception of Jesus or the virgin birth. It means that the Virgin Mary was sanctified from sin at the instant in which the seed from which she was formed detached from her parents. So the term refers to the immaculate conception of Mary, not Jesus. Uh, anyway, he really did travel to North Africa to convert Muslims. He was greeted with surprise and incomprehension. You know you're going to be killed, don't you? If I don't do it, somebody will. But then, Moved by his sincerity and facility with their language, they allowed him to preach, to engage in debates, and to study with them. He visited Tunis in 1291 and 1304 without major incident, but on his third vision, uh, visit, 
in 1308, he was stoned by an angry mob, returned to Majorca, and died at home, pretty much as he predicted. Lull, in fact, wrote many books on how to convert the reluctant. But his greatest accomplishment to that end was an evolving sequence of works that eventually became known as the Lullian art. This is a system of logic and discourse that Lull claimed to have been shown to him by the divine, a machine for thinking whose structure reveals the underlying language God uses in the creation. His most concise form of it was in the Ars Brevis, or short art, composed in 1308. The conceptual innovation that led to the Lullian art is thought to have been based on a device from Arabic astrology called the Zairja. The wheels within wheels were intended to be rotated in all permutations as a way of generating new ideas. This is how the first figure of the art, figure A, appeared in the original Latin. And here is the figure A in English. Each of the nine slices is assigned to an aspect of God, goodness, greatness, duration, power, wisdom, will, virtue, truth, and glory. These categories, and all the figures of the art, are to be learned by heart. Here is figure T, which lays out functions that can be applied to each of the categories in figure A. This is the third figure, memorably referred to as the third figure. This is simply a mapping of the pairing of each of the nine categories with the other eight. One is supposed to become agile with this matrix in order to combine the categories without omission. And this fourth figure is called, yes, the fourth figure, and is the true descendant of the Arabic uh, Zairja, showing how the combinations of the pairs of categories actually needs to proceed to at least three levels. I think one is supposed to construct a moving one out of something like stiff paper and a pin. Lowell then proceeds to expound questions, subjects, virtues, vices, rules, principles, mixtures of principles and rules, the hundred forms and their definitions, example questions and their answers, and finally guidelines for how to teach others this extremely handy discipline. And the amazing thing is, it was a huge hit. Because all of this was said to be based on the indisputable properties of God, the arguments somehow generated from the system were considered to be indisputable, and so it was thought to be a priceless skill to master for scholarship within Christendom and conversion beyond it. After Lowell's death, it languished in popularity for a time outside of its application to, to alchemy, but then experienced a revival in the late 1400s and was the cause of endless activity in universities, royal courts, seminaries, and publishing houses clear through to the mid-1600s, at which point it all popped like a soap bubble. Just before that, the philosopher Leibniz was inspired by it for much of his work, including his invention of calculus. But then, within a generation, not only was there no one doing the Lullian art, there was almost no memory of what people were doing when they did the Lullian art, let alone why. It is now credited for being the first complete system of combinatorial logic that in its way planted the seeds for computer programming. But it seems to me that there's this whole esoteric side to this about what happens to the mind when it goes into this vast complexity of an alternative logic dedicated to the contemplation of the divine, not to mention the alchemy. And I wonder why, at least in the English speaking world at least, no one is doing anything with this. So there you have Raymond Lowe, Dr. Illuminatus. Now to note briefly a few points of light. Hildegard of Bingen, in 1098 to 1179 was an abbess, philosopher, visual artist, visionary, and perhaps most memorably a composer whose music almost compels one into a higher state. It is difficult to study her work and not come away believing in the miraculous. Joachim of Fiori, 1135 to 1202, announced three ages of mankind. The first, the age of the father, corresponding to the Old Testament, called the time of thorns. The second, the age of the sun, corresponding to the New Testament, called the time of roses. And third, the age of the Holy Spirit, was a new dispensation of universal love and perfect freedom, called the time of lilies. Eleanor of Aquitaine, from 1137 to 1204, brought the ideals of courtly love from Aquitaine to France and England. 
This not only elevates respect for women, at least noble women, but it opens a door for the reimagining of the, of the divine feminine as is later found in the Grail mythos. And I'd also like to mention a couple of manuals for individual work. The Philokalia, a large collection of advanced contemplative practices from the Orthodox monastic tradition, cultivating mindfulness and self-transformation is now a standard part of the literature for all Orthodox churches. And also The Cloud of Unknowing, a late 14th century Middle English guide for the personal experience of the negative theology of Pseudo-Dionysius as a spiritual way. In the first century of the Common Era in Palestine, there was an explosion of spiritual creativity and liberation. Almost immediately, there was a contrary response to cool it down. The early church began to form centralized authority and the Gnostic branch arose as a reaction to that, only to be eventually ground down and snuffed out of existence. Christianity went from being a small embattled sect to the only tolerated religion of the Roman Empire and ultimately all Europe, from persecuted to persecutors. It went from being a teaching of inner self as a source of divine truth to being the only religion in the world that insists on the separation of the divine and the individual soul. And yet, and yet we see in generation after generation across all lands, the endless resourcefulness of the spirit to reassert itself in new and vibrant ways within the challenges of its circumstances. Myriad manifestations of Christian esotericism offer inspiration to the Christian touched by the spirit, the pneumatic Christian to use Valentinian terms, but also to the Illuminists, the pneumatics of all stripes in the diversity of expression and the penetration of insight offered by these works of genius on fire with their dedication to magnify and return to their divine source. Thank you. <laughs>